Good afternoon to you all. And I'm actually pleased that the first session must have gone too badly because I see there are some familiar faces back. Thank you very much for coming back. I really do appreciate it. For those, those of you who have not met me as yet, uh, Shane Crawford is my name. I'm the Managing Director of Specialist Collections and Consultants Limited, um, an Auckland-based debt collection practice, credit management company and a legal services company. Yes, you heard right, I am from Auckland, but there are some good guys in Auckland, so don't worry, it's okay. Um, listen, welcome today, and we're going to be covering, in half an hour, um, a pretty important topic, and that is terms of trade. Having clear terms of trade will ensure the smooth running of your business. Okay, smooth running of your business is paramount. It's one of the most useful front-end tools for business, is having effective processes and procedures for engaging the client and customer relationship. It's going to give you some certainty around doing business with your client. Terms of trade clarify the rights and obligations of the parties. So that also helps you because it's going to give you conciseness, clarity, and consistency with your customers. So they know what to expect from you, and <coughs> they know what to expect from them, and there's nothing worse than doing business in a general way, and as we say, the goalposts always move. First, it just gives you some benefits on terms of trade, and that they create the obligations of the party, they create certainty between the buyer and the seller, and this has a positive aspect in reducing potentials for misunderstanding. The last thing that you do want to happen, have happen, is disputes arise between yourselves and your clients. So again, consistency and clarification always help. What should, you, what should the term to trade include? Well, this is um, interesting, and this is where it gets a bit technical, and we've just generalised here because we only have half an hour, and I would like uh, to offer you, all of you, one thing, and that is uh, on the pads <coughs> at the desktop reception uh, <coughs> specialist collections, there is, uh, down the bottom is our email address. We would be delighted to answer any questions that you have regarding to your term to trade. You're most welcome to email us at any time and I undertake that uh, myself or one of the team will be back in contact with you within 24 hours and your questions will be answered. More importantly, we're happy to mentor, mentor you, if uh, I may say that respectfully, and if you want to make a call, pick up the phone and we're happy to speak to you over the phone. We are, about, uh, we are a company that is about adding value to business. So we want your money returned to you, and one of the ways that your money is returned to you is through robust term to trade which is going to protect you, so it's important. When you, I will say earlier, after speaking to a couple of individuals and hearing their experiences, it's really interesting. Uh, do you need terms of trade if you're a lawn mowing contractor? Do you need terms of trade if you are um, a Green Acres gardener? Do you need terms of trade if you're a small business just starting out and you're self-funding your business? And maybe when you're looking at your costs, you think to yourself, oh, I'll probably get to that later. No, I respectfully say no. I say you need them from the time that you open your doors. Because your best intentions and your value and your passion uh, for your business may not be shared by those who you're doing business with. And you think that if you provide a good in, a goods or services, that you're going to be paid and paid within the, your guidelines or your, your terms or your payment terms, that's not often the case. And you need, therefore, the, the added protection of term to trade to basically enforce your rights. And that's, and that's what they are. And that's very important. So some of the things that you would have in term to trade is your definitions. And that's, um, that's good. I mean, a key term should include the parties to the terms, such as a buyer and a seller and more importantly describe the goods and the services that you are providing. Quotations, orders and acceptance. This is interesting because this deals with around offer, the law of offer and acceptance. So you will provide a quote. If that quote is accepted, then you are legally bound to uh, supply the goods and services at that price 
on that quote, because a quote is different to an estimate. Actually, can I just say, who knows the difference between an estimate and a quote? Not really. Not really. An estimate is a general idea of what something will cost, but if you provide a quotation and you provide that quotation in writing, you are bound by it. And if you happen to have made a mistake in your pricing or whatever it was, and then you want to go back and change your mind after the quote has been accepted, and say, actually, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, um, it's actually, it costs, will actually cost this much money, the law says, I'm sorry, you provided a quote and that quote was accepted. So <coughs> that is the difference between an estimate and a quote. And quotations, once accepted, form a binding contract at that price. Can you have, um, so if you give a quote, can you put things up and above the quote, or on and above the quote? What I would suggest you do is, sometimes you see this with foreign exchange calculations or provisions of, of goods from overseas. So lawyers, if you've ever seen a lawyer's invoice, and down the bottom it has um, E, errors and emissions, e -E -E, errors and emissions excluded, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's what the lawyers do, how they get around that, and then you could do like, something similar into your terms of trade to protect any variations and therefore any extra charges on charging after the quote's been provided. Price and payment terms. This is very, very important because it's, to me, it's actually at the heart of your whole business relationship about what you're charging and then what you expect from your, your customer about paying you and when they're going to pay you um, on time there. So that's interesting. And in your payment terms, you can include such things as late payment fees. You see, um, if you have had the opportunity to review terms of trade, you'll see that all sorts of companies come up with default interest at 1.5, 2.5%, 3.75% per month. It's actually, I say respectfully, for lawyers who are um, doing legal work, as such as we do, um, and sealing judgments or applying to the court to have a judgment entered against a, uh, a company, calculating this can be a nightmare because it's sometimes it's compounded and you've got to fill in a big sheet to satisfy the court registrar of what the, the interest charges are. Sometimes it's best to have a straight 10% figure, 10% on the outstanding balance, um, compounded monthly. It's a fair and reasonable amount. It's easy to calculate. And why it's easy to, why you want your default interest clause to be easy to calculate, especially if you use a lawyer, is because it's going to take less of their time and attendances and you get a cheaper legal book. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> um, so that's the thing that just There are, depending on the, on the nature of the business and the goods, the services that you provide and also the goods, you are bound by certain statutory um, obligations. The Consumer Guarantees Act deals with um, personal, domestic and household goods, so different to a business arrangement. So if you're buying, say for example, someone's buying a, um, a toaster from you or um, a kettle from you, you're bound by the Consumer Guarantees Act, and there are guarantees within that Consumer Guarantees Act relating to acceptable quality, um, acceptable price, and it's going to be effective uh, for the purpose that it was designed for. So you have consumer guarantees. The Consumer Guarantees Act you cannot contract out of. So if you're writing timber trade and you provide a domestic or household service or a good, and you don't want the Consumer Guarantees Act to, to apply, I'm sorry, you're wrong, you can't contract out of the Act, so you've got to really make sure that your, your service is, is performed and, and dealt with as you quoted, described, and that your goods are of acceptable quality. Can I just ask a question? So, so if you admit it in your terms of trade, that doesn't mean you, you're, um, that you've avoided it, you still are bound by it? Yes, you are, correct. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Delivery arrangements is really important. Um, how many times have you heard in your careers, oh, we delivered goods, they say they never received them, and now they're not going to pay? So this is where this delivery clause comes in. A lot of businesses courier goods, or they have their own transportation. So you want to say delivery happens, I would suggest, when the goods, um, delivery will, will happen when the goods have been delivered to the customer 
and sign for. So you need to keep good records about delivery receipts uh, and, and of course um, a readable name of the person who signed for them on that delivery receipts and you can say in your terms of trade as soon as the goods are delivered at that time that delivery receipts were signed it's irrefutable proof that you have received the goods whether you lose them in your warehouse or someone's misplaced them or dare I say it if someone happened to put them in the boot of their car instead of the warehouse you've been signed but they are you owe, you owe them. Ownership of goods is important because it, it, it comes to risk and title and when ownership passes. So you do want to know that you will maintain ownership of your goods until payment. Now, I haven't touched on the Personal Property Securities <coughs> Act um, and, and registering financing statements on the Personal Property Securities Register here for this morning's uh, talk because it is a complex uh, piece of legislation. But if you are dealing with uh, supplying goods and goods of a high value, you may want to take legal advice about registering financing statements on the Personal Property Securities Act register to protect your interest in those goods, which gives you a right of repossession. And in the event that a company goes into liquidation, receivership, administration, or all three, that your security interest is protected and you have a level of security interest whereby you can take those goods back again. So again, if you are dealing with high dollar value goods that you are supplying, you should um, really take some legal advice concerning the Personal Property Securities Act and, and registering those, uh, those things. This is interesting because sometimes you deal, you deal with a regular customer and you might not want them to um, have to fill in a quotation every time for maybe a hundred transactions a month um, or del delivery receipts around a hundred deliveries in a, in a month. So you can write in a delivery clause and, and make it to fit to your purpose um, around such things as that um, supplying goods and services on a regular and ongoing basis. It is not necessary to have set the terms signed off for every transaction with the customer in this situation, the terms can be modified to reflect that they apply to all the transactions that take place during your business relationship with that, uh, with that customer. Something that's really, really important, especially if you're dealing with companies, and companies most uh, usually, uh, I call them uh, two, di two shareholder director companies, meaning often husband and wife or two partners or a one director, one shareholder company. company. Even though they have limited after their name and the companies, and a company is a separate legal entity to an individual or us, or all of the individuals here, you're in essence, they are run by individuals and the company is obviously um, run in such a way that it, that, it, that is if you are dealing with an individual anyway. It's not a big corporate with these many directors and many shareholders and a professional organisation. So. Personal guarantee is important because when you do business and provide goods and services, often you don't know much about the individual or individuals that you're dealing with, and really simple things like uh, the equity in that company, or how, often how long it's been running for, or the potential success for that company given the goods and services that they, they, they provide themselves. And um, you want a, a layer of protection, so if the company went into liquidation or receivership or administration, as I said earlier, or all three, you want the ability to say, the company's folded, I'm not going to get any money because the liquidator tells me that I'm not going to get anything because often you'll be what is regarded as an unsecured creditor. Um, however, I have a personal guarantee, so I'm going to come to you and I'm going to go, your company failed. You owe me, the company owes me $1,000, but now I'm sorry, you guaranteed the debt on behalf of your company, so therefore you personally owe me that $1,000. And personal guarantees for small business, I believe, is absolutely crucial because money is everything. Um, the money coming into your business helps, run, uh, helps fund your lives, but more importantly, it funds your business and it funds your growth and it funds your goals. And if you don't get money, then you struggle and your business suffers because of a lack of cash. So you want to get your money back from as many 
from as many avenues as possible. So that's something you, that you would seek for yourself, that you would go and ask? You should be, you're, you're, you'd say yes, and I want to have a clause written into my team yep. to trade whereby these, that the, the directors of a company that we do business with will provide a personal guarantee. Yep. Absolutely. Would they often sign? Because obviously we're talking about the company, so you know, it's, it's a good question, and you're right. Um, I've just come across one recently, uh, a very old established company that had been in business for years, and they did write on the term to trade, and I saw the original term to trade document, which said, we have been in business for many, many years, we are honourable people, we pay our bills. And the building company who we were acting for accepted that on its merits, and guess what? No. Those honourable directors yeah. got to a certain age and retired, and in come mm -hmm. a son. But a son with different thought processes and different values. And we had a problem. No personal guarantee. The company wasn't going to pay. It was going to become a costly exercise. And they were on the verge of liquidation. So we had on the verge of liquidation and also no personal guarantee. There was a potential 100% loss coming up. But we managed to save it, and the company did now, actually, as of Friday, has made an offer in a settlement which hasn't been accepted as yet, but it is things. So, yes, you were right. Big companies or individuals will say, no, if you want our business and you, yeah. you want to do this, we're not going to sign it. And that, it's a hard question to answer, and it's going to come from your commercial acumen and your, and your experience in your field to do your research and your due diligence on that company to go, I can take the risk and maybe carry this. But I would say to you, if you're getting a new client, and go into the company's office. The company's office is great, www.companies.govt.nz. And you'll see a lot of small companies have $100 as a share capital. Okay, so we'll set up with $100 or $1,000. And, but they are privately held companies. So it's not like a company on the share market where you can go along to a meeting and they're going to show you their financials and their bank balances and what is owed and what is owed, and you're going to sit there and go, well, I'm protected, they, these people are going to pay me. With individuals, you're going, they're going to, we're private people, so we're our own private companies, we're going to protect everything, and we're not going to tell you how much or how little is in our banking account or how much or how little we do owe to other creditors if we, you know, if we do owe money, if we default. And, you, and this is your decision, and you might go, you're a newish company, you've been set up with a $100 share capital, you don't want to give me a personal guarantee, but you're asking for a, a high credit limit, and I'm going to, you might say, no. Or you might say, counter that and go, hey, you want to sign a personal guarantee? Okay, we talked about it earlier in debt collection, I might, my recommendation to you would be, well then you're in the right. I'll give you half your credit limit, and you pay me on time, and you build a relationship over time, and then we'll increase it. Okay, something like that. Privacy Act authorisation, Privacy Act 1993, um, necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really necessary because it's an authority from the client allowing you to ask questions about them in general. So if someone comes to you to open a credit account or wants to do business with you, and you might say, I've never heard of you before, specialist collections, are you a bit dodgy, are you good guys? <laughs> and then you can say, give me the names and addresses or phone numbers of two or three uh, references, trade references, and I'm going to ring these people, and they're going to say, specialist collections and consultants limited wants to start to do business with us, can you please tell me if they have a credit account with you and how, it, how has it been conducted? And they're going to say, do you have a privacy waiver? Yes, here it is, I'm going to email it to you and I'm going to fax it to you and that privacy waiver is going to say, I hereby name, authorise company ABC uh, to, to release to you all my private and personal information and then they're going to come back to you and they're going to go, exemplary client, pays on time or occasion, you might go, they're a bit up and down with their payments, sometimes a bit hard to get hold of and there's some issues with us, but generally they pay, but you really got to drag it out of no, you don't want to hear that, <laughs> but it happens. Um, so when you hear those things, then you can make your own commercial decisions around um, you know, whether you want to do business or not. But information is paramount. Understanding your risk. When you go and do business from A to B, it's a risk, and you want to eliminate that risk 
as much as possible, but more importantly, you really want to understand it and uh, do business with that person in a way that is going to be reflective of that risk. So it's, it's crucial. So uh, privacy act clause in your terms of trade, hugely important. Debt collection clause, really, really, really important. Because if you do need to go to a debt collection agency, such as Specialist Collections and Consultants mm -hmm. Limited, who I understand are pretty good, mm -hmm. um, you know, you want to be able to get your money back. So your original debt plus debt collection fees, whereby you are not losing debt collection fees off your original debt amount. So it's really important. We've given you some basic um, other clauses that you might want to consider given the nature of your business. Returns and cancellations. So you might say um, if, if goods aren't returned within a certain period of time, therefore you are deemed to have taken possession of them and therefore you are deemed to um, take ownership and therefore you must pay them. You want to be concerned with the, with the law that regard, you know, governs your business and the legislation that governs your business and don't take any shortcuts. I say that respectfully. In business, do it 110% correct because there may be a time that comes whereby it's going to jump up and bite you and it could cost you money. Dispute resolution. I think I spoke to someone earlier today and gave an example about something. How many times have you heard it? Goods or services have been provided, then later on, then you haven't been paid, you can't get hold of the person, and then a month or two months later, oh no, actually, I have a dispute. I'm going to give you a, a prime example. Of, and I might repeat myself for one or two people, but as part of our customer service, we provide, we like to help business. So we um, collect small debts, and there was one lawn mowing debt that came across my desk for $50. And what happens was that the lawn mowing contractor went to the home the first time, mowed the lawns, and got paid. The second time he goes up, and as lawn mowing contractors do, they don't go and ask for money first, they just go mm -hmm. and perform the service. Went up to the door and asked for his money, and the lady said, look, I'm sorry, I can't pay you today, but I need you again in a fortnight, and I'll, I'll double up and I'll pay you then. The fine chap accepted that, and as he did, and unwittingly the third time he went back, didn't knock on the door first and ask for his money, he went and mowed the lawns. After the third mow, knocked on the door again, asked for his money, and the woman said, you know what, I'm not going to pay you for that second one because you know what, you didn't do a good job, but I'll pay you for the third one. Now, we have a strong belief through our experience and what we do that we call it small balance theft. People will wear you down by just simply not answering phone calls, refusing to communicate and refusing to take personal ownership because they know there's debts of a certain value that maybe if they just keep their head down long enough, it gets going to go away because it's going to be too small for you to do anything about. So what you can do here is you can just say in your um, dispute resolution clause, you can say if there is a dispute, depending on the nature of your service, you've got to email it to us in writing within 24 hours or seven days and in writing. Okay? And if, then if it's not, well then they'll leave you liable to pay your service. And then of course, you, depending on what is owed, you can either go to the speech tribunal or the district court to obtain an order or a judgment to get your money. So, it's about putting, protecting yourselves from this type of behaviour. We touch on the Guarantees Acts. Um, use of account and account closures are interesting. You have a right, you know, insurance companies. I don't know, you see people, have you heard stories? Unfortunately, um, every year your insurance policy is renewed, and every year you need to go back to the insurance company whether you've made a claim or not, and said to them, actually, I had a couple of accidents this year, but I haven't claimed them, but I've had a couple of accidents, or I've got a speeding fine or a conviction, and you meant to disclose that to the insurance company every year. Then they go through their checklist and they go, yes, we will offer a renewal of your insurance for you on, these, on this cost and on these terms, or they might go, mm, see you later, you better go and find somewhere else. So here, with, it's very similar. If they have to, with regard to credit terms and the conduct of their account, you want that option to go one day, this is how many times you've been behind in your payments, this is a level of difficulty that you'll put us to to actually recover your money, 
um, the, the, the administration costs through phone calls and letters and time and attendances and all this is weighed up. And you know what? We're actually going to cancel your account. We don't want it anymore. And that gives you the right to do that in writing within certain terms. Okay. Liability. <coughs> um, you want to reduce your liability. So you want clauses that you're in business, you're a small business, you don't want situations where, whereby something goes wrong or it may be without your control. Um, and then someone's coming along and taking legal action against you. So you want to escape your liability and or put it down to a bare minimum. So be very careful of that. Who knows what force majeure is? Have you ever heard of that word or force majeure? Okay. It's, again, escaping liability. It is if something if you are a supplier and you need, and your client places a good order with you and your client is relying on that order to be fulfilled to complete a contract and get paid, but something happens and there's a strike, or there's been, you need to order materials from overseas and there's been internal issues in that country and the goods haven't left the country to come to you to pass on to your customer. It says under that clause force majeure, it, your loss, your customer's loss, was not through your own making. It was not your fault, it was the making of a third party and therefore you can't be held liable for their loss. So that is quite crucial to have in your, in your terms of trade, depending on what um, goods and services that you do have. The last time, I went over my half an hour, because I got a bit carried away with debt collection. Now, I can see there's a half an hour that is up. Please, if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint presentation on terms of trade, please email me. I'd be delighted to send it to you. If you have any questions, email us, ring me. Happy to help. Um, but if you have any questions in the meantime, I'm happy to answer them until such time as we get kicked out of here. But, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, in our terms, we say payment within seven days, yep. but we deal with quite a few companies that will only pay on the 20th of the month. And we've said to them, look, yeah. these are our trades and they just say, well, oh, we pay on the 20th of the month and that's it. Mm. Yeah, so you've been bullied. Look, uh, anyway, and just let me add a little bit to that. Uh, we, do, we do a lot of work for... Um, for, for clients who now um, have a parent company in Australia. So instead of getting paid by the 20th of the following month, we actually get, they pay us two months later. Yeah. And it's becoming a norm. And that's just becoming a, a, a practice and becoming, a, I'm reluctant to say a standard practice, but a regular practice. Um, um, and it's not legal. Your term to trade are what they are. And if they have agreed to those terms to trade and signed them, you can say, fine. Especially if cash flow has been affected because they're paying you late, and con or contributing to a lack of cash flow because of their payment method, then you can say, well, look, that's fine. You agreed that our term to trade is seven days. You agreed to pay debt collection costs and penalty interest in the event of your late payment default. We are not a bank. We are not a finance company. This is our term to trade. Then you pay the extra if that's what they're going to do. And more importantly, if there is no dispute, no dispute at all on, your, on the goods provided or the service provided, and they've gone over your payment terms, and it is a company, service statutory demand. Now, they might jump up and down and kick and butt, but if there's no dispute, then if you serve a statutory demand, they have 15 working days to pay you. And if they don't pay you within that 15 working days, then technically that is a presumption of insolvency. And you could, if you wanted to, apply to the High Court to liquidate that company. But where you'd go that far is another thing, but you can. But in your communications with them, armed with all this knowledge, mm -hmm. you can go back and sell that concept to them to get your payment. And you can get terms of trade signed, like obviously for new work, because obviously we haven't worked with this company. We could do it now for any future work. Yeah, and that's why it's important, because you know you've been doing it ongoing, yeah. and in your terms of trade, you can, a bit like that insurance policy analogy that I gave you, there's no reason why you can't say in terms of trade or credit accounts are reviewed every year. You know, and then when that 12 months comes around and, and those clients who have not signed term to trade before, you can say, you've got to sign term to trade now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm.